Really beautiful. And this next, this next uh, storyteller, our final storyteller of the evening, is a true renaissance man. Beautiful on the inside and out. What more can I say? If you don't know Clay Newcomb, you're about to. Please welcome, straight from Arkansas, Clay Newcomb. Y'all know this song? He's big around the middle. Let, it, let it play for just a minute. Across the run, running this old slew foot. If you don't know this song, you need to know it. If I'd have known they were going to have guitars here tonight, I would have played it. Some folks say he looks a lot like me. Some folks say he looks a lot like me. All right, thanks, guys. Hey, I want to, uh, I want to tell you a turkey hunting story. And uh, I actually planned to let out a barred owl hoot on the way up, I got distracted by the song, but who, who's the best barred owl hooter in the audience? Just belt it out. Any barred owl hooters? Yeah, there's some pretty good ones. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I think a man carries a lot of street cred, especially in the south in Arkansas where I'm from, if he's good at barred owl hooting because it's an essential tool to turkey hunting. So I want to tell you a turkey hunting story. And I want to tell you too that this story doesn't have any like deep significance other than that just it was a great turkey hunting story. So I don't have any, you know, it didn't change my life other than that being in wild places I think does and can impact us if we carry those things in the right way. And uh, this is a story of man versus nature. So in Arkansas, as many of you know, we've had some tough years of, uh, of turkey hunting. There's been some, we've lost about 60% of our birds, and so there's not that many turkeys. And the only good thing about not having a lot of turkeys is that the value of a turkey goes way up. All right, so I grew up in the 90s in Arkansas. I was in high school in the 1990s, and we had a lot of turkeys. And so I grew up with good turkey hunting. And then all of a sudden, when you don't have good turkey hunting, you realize you've lost something, and so you want it even more. And uh, so what happens when you lose your turkeys, and we've lost about 60% of our birds in Arkansas from our peak numbers. And many of you would know the reasons behind that, you know. It's, uh, it's increased predation and mesopredators. It's habitat land management is different. It's forest, the forestry industry is different than it used to be. Um, seasons are, have been not so conserved. It's a lot of different reasons. Well, we've lost a lot of our turkeys. The only good thing is, is that the value increases. So when turkeys are distressed, they cluster up. So if you imagine turkeys all spread all across the landscape, when a turkey population decreases, you'll find clusters. And what that produces on public land is a lot of pressure on those clusters because every other hillbilly in the world knows where those turkeys are. And so they go and hunt those turkeys and then those turkeys are really hard to hunt. Some of those hillbillies from Arkansas might even be here tonight that are pressuring these turkeys. Well, so this story took place in 2013. My son, Bear John Newcomb, he, is, uh, he was eight years old at the time. And what had happened was I had found a cluster of these turkeys that all these other hillbillies had been harassing. So these turkeys were very difficult to hunt. I knew where these birds were roosting, but I could not call them in for anything. That, you know, I worked these birds, worked these birds, but they roosted in the same place three, three days in a row. And so I knew I had to change things up. So I checked my boy out of school a little bit early, and we, uh, I took a ground blind with me, which no God-fearing southern turkey hunter would ever do in his life. So uh, not to, you know, beat on any of you western turkey hunters. I think it's really cute when guys from the west think they're good turkey hunters. Um, um, <laughs> I took, my, I took my turkey blind because I had my eight-year-old son with me, and we were going to hunt this turkey in a non-traditional fashion. I went back in right where I believed those turkeys were going to roost, and I set up this ground blind. Well, I had my son there, and uh, it was one of his first turkey hunts, and I was showing him we were just going to do some light calling and maybe call one of these birds in was coming back to the roost. I was showing him how to use a slate call. And, uh, and we were, you know, just doing what dads do, talking to him about what we're doing, the strategy, and, you know, just kind of fostering 
in him uh, uh, just some fun in what we're doing, teaching him what we're doing. Well, directly I do what dads sometimes do. I fell dead asleep. While I was asleep, deep in slumber, my boy elbows me in the side and he says, Daddy, I just heard a turkey gobble. And I, I said, really, you heard a turkey gobble? Are you sure? I didn't even know if he knew really what a turkey sounded like. And, and I said, where was it? And he pointed over there, he said, it was right over there. And so I grabbed my call and I let out a few yelps and sure enough, turkey gobbles, pow. And I go, well, man, you really did. So we worked this bird, we worked him all afternoon and the bird never would come in. You remember all those hillbillies that had been calling this turkey before me, right? And so this bird knew what was up, but he gobbled. And uh, he came in and just, we never got a shot. When you're hunting with two people in a blind, often you're, I'm amazed at what you don't see because the other person sees something. And so right about dusk, and this turkey gobbled until right about dusk, I was, must have been looking another direction, but my boy said, Daddy, I just saw that turkey fly up in a tree. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, I saw that turkey fly up in that tree right there. And I, you know, I pointed, I was like, which tree? You know, how far, where's he at? And, this was some very, very good intel for what I needed because I knew where this Arkansas goblin turkey was roosted. And that's a good thing when the next day is also turkey season. It was before Onyx, so I didn't have any way to mark the spot. We were just going off just traditional woodsmanship of just knowing where you're at. And I knew that I had to devise a plan. I love Onyx, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I had to devise a plan to get this turkey. And any God-fearing Southern turkey hunter knows when it is time to bushwhack a turkey. I mean, I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about, but there's sometimes you cannot call up a turkey and you have to reach deep inside the entrails of the wild hunter man inside of yourself. You gotta find a new way to hunt a turkey. So I knew right where this turkey was asleep and so I decided that I was gonna wake up the next morning very, very, very early, and I was gonna to try to be where I parked my truck three hours before daylight. It was a dry spring, or at least it was dry on that day. The woods were crunchy, the leaves were loud, and many of you would know turkeys are pretty forgiving when it comes to noises when it's black dark. They cannot see in the dark. They hear animals underneath them when they're roosted. So you can get away with a little bit of noise. So my plan was this, get in there super early, and it was a mile and a half back to where this bird was roosting, and I was gonna come over the ridge within 200 yards of where he was at, and I was gonna take off my boots, and I was gonna put on a big thick pair of socks, and then I was gonna take the next two hours, and I was going to creep into not 100 yards, not 80 yards, not 60 yards, not 50 yards. I was gonna creep within shotgun range of where Bear John Newcomb told me that turkey was roosted. And so, and I knew I went, that calling was not gonna call this turkey in. So I get to this, there's kinda, you kinda just come over this rise and you can hear down where this turkey was. And at, you know, it was probably in the, in the three o'clock range. I come over this ridge and that turkey is gobbling in the roost two and a half hours before daylight. And uh, man, I knew right where he was. I mean, I could hear him. And I can't course turkeys very well because I can't hear out of this ear very good. But I mean, I could hear him gobbling. And I thought, man, I'm in the chips. So I sat down on the ground, took my boots off, put my big socks on. And while I was on the ground, I, I saw, you know, it, the, the night was starry. I mean, you could just look up and it was still and it was starry, and there, were, there was not, a, the rain forecast was zero. It was a perfect spring morning, not a breath of wind. And I, I see what appears to be a flash of lightning. And you know how on a starry night, sometimes if there's a thunderstorm way off, you just see a, you see a flash of light, flash of light, flash of light, and you know, you kind of have to look at it, and you're like, is that car lights, or what is that? And you, and you go, that's, a, that's, that's lightning. It was really weird. I pulled up my phone. I did have cell coverage back in there. And I pull up weather.com. And on the radar, you could see from Memphis, Tennessee, to Oklahoma City, to Kansas City, Missouri, down to Texarkana, Arkansas. And I live in Northwest Arkansas. And there was not a cloud in the sky, not a, not a cloud on the radar. 
except for one tiny bright red thunderhead about as big as a pin that was about three miles to the west of me. And man, about the time I saw that, I started to see the trees kind of sway just a little bit, a little bit of breeze, huh? And man, I saw, I saw lightning, I still couldn't hear it. Directly, I heard thunder. And I thought, man, that thunderstorm is about to come right over the top of me. And it wasn't long until that thunderstorm, it didn't just come over the top of the mountain, that thunderstorm engulfed the mountain. I mean, absolutely engulfed the mountain. I started hearing rain pitter patter and the trees started moving and man, it came a squall, big time. Rain just pounding the ground. And, and it, it, the boys from the south up there know what I would be thinking when this happened. This is a very good thing for me. Man, I took off my socks, put my boots back on, and I started marching directly to that tree. I mean, it was, it was the absolute best possible scenario for this turkey hunt was for me to have the cover of this thunderstorm to be able to move in on this bird. And man, I took off, I mean, just in almost a jog going right straight towards that turkey. And the thunder and lightning was so strong that at one point lightning cracked beside me so close that I threw my shotgun. I am a hillbilly myself. I'm not a scientist, but I do know that if you're holding like big metal things in your hand, when you are engulfed in a thunderstorm, this is not a good thing. So I literally threw the shotgun as far as I could away from me and laid flat on the ground until that thunderstorm moved off. And it, I mean, it probably lasted six or seven minutes. And I was soaking wet, wet to the bone. And about the time, a thun you know how a thunderstorm, when it passes, a real heavy one, you know, the tail of it is pretty soft and there's rain, but it's not that bad. Man, I ran over, grabbed up my shotgun, and I ran in there, not 50, not 40, but probably about 35 yards from that roost tree. And I sat there in the black dark for the next two hours and waited for it to get light. And Mr. Mr. Arkansas Goblin Turkey never let out another gobble the rest of the morning. I thought maybe he got struck by lightning. He didn't, I mean, when it came time, when it came goblin time, he did not gobble. And I knew exactly what I had to do. And I mean, I'm, I'm peeking around the trees. I wasn't gonna shoot him in the tree. I, I was peeking around the trees trying to find him. I knew, I, I mean, I knew the, the bird was in sight. And I did let out, right at fly down time, I let out one, that's all I did. One cluck. And directly, I don't know how he got to the ground. I didn't hear him fly. I didn't see him fly. All I know is that just when it was light enough to see 40 yards, I saw that sucker coming up the mountain, skirting around me, pulled the gun down, boom, shot him. Soaking wet, turkey's soaking wet. Reach over there, pick him up big, beautiful Arkansas goblin turkey, put him on my back, walked out, went to my son's school, pulled him out of school and said, I killed that turkey. And uh, <laughs> man, hey, that, that usually as hunters, we are fighting against the forces of nature. But that was one scenario where probably the rest of my life, I'll never have a more advantageous situation for killing the goblin turkey. Thanks guys, appreciate it. He's big around the middle and he's broke across the run. Running 90 miles an hour, taking My favorite hillbilly right there, ever. Let's give a round of applause for all our storytellers tonight. After all we went through last year, after doing this virtually last year, being a part of that effort, to be here with all of you and, and hear all these awesome stories from people from around this country, it, I, I can't tell you how much I want to personally thank all of you for showing up, for traveling to be here. Uh, and let's just give one more round of applause for BHA, for Rendezvous, for what this represents for public lands and conservation.